Thank you so much, Pastor Rudolph. In this time, I would like to introduce uh, Mulana Ahmad Pandu to come and speak. Thank you. alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Greetings. Firstly, we'd like to thank Pastor Rudolph for uh, inviting us to the event, and, and we'd like to thank the Rima Bible Church that has uh, organized the event as well. Uh, some, just give me some time before I uh, comment. Some time ago, we written a book called uh, The Concept of God's Mercy in Islam and Christianity. This book has made thousands of prints and been, has been given out and is on the websites and on the internet. Pastor Rudolph has taken the time to make a rebuttal of the book point by point uh, on his Ed Lusum website. He's uh, rebutted my book. But I think Pastor still has to make a good thousand copies in order to distribute, and I hope he gets a chance to make that. And the other book that we, like, we have published, it's called um, Basic Islamic Principles for Christians. We have printed some of the books, and the author is also present, my close friend, Mohammed Kuvadia, and we will give him some time to speak on his book, and maybe we can give a present to whoever wants, who has the permission of the, uh, the church. Um, <clears throat> To go back as we, Pastor and I decided a technical point, that we're coming together and we're going together. So uh, if I'm going to beat him in this debate, he's going to leave me on the road. Just kidding. Uh, we decided to show that though we have major differences, we can agree to discuss, debate, understand, and share ideologies without getting a fit or without wanting to convert somebody into, his, into a different faith. And the moment you differ with somebody, then sometimes you become aggressive and you want to throw the frying pan at him or you want to throw this at him or you want to call him a terrorist or you want to call him the most demeaning people in a frenzy of missionary activities. And both myself and pastor are not like that. And those apologists in the world that are like that, we sincerely advise you not to go down the route of arrogance and fighting. As the Quran speaks about the people of the book, when the Quran speaks about the Christians, we say, those, From the people of the Christians, you find those that are devoted to learning and devoted to, to, to studies. They are avoiding themselves from the things of the world. They do not have pride. And I think it would be befitting to honor pastor that he might be in that category of Christians that are devoted men of learning, understanding, and teaching, and those that are not arrogant. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِيَ أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ نُزُلًا مِّنْ غَفُورٍ رَّحِيمٍ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ The first words of Jesus. The Quran mentions the first words of Jesus. السلام علي يوم ولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا Jesus said as a baby in infancy. Peace be upon me on my birthday. Peace be upon me on the day I shall die. And peace be upon me on the day I shall be resurrected alive. This is the first words for Jesus and the Muslim perspective of Jesus is peace be upon him. And peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet Moses, Abraham and the Prophet Jesus. And amongst the first words he spoke, he said, Mubarakan aina ma kunt. I, Jesus, am blessed wherever I might be. Yes, this is in the Quran. In the Surah Maryam, the first miracle of Jesus, the first words of Jesus, it had to do with peace, and only peace wherever he might have been. As a Muslim, I endorse that Jesus was peace and peaceful and everything about his being was peaceful. And it drives me, as a Muslim, to defend the claim made by the Bible that Jesus was, might be a better word for me to use, but I have to use it, 
accursed. Wow, what is he saying? A Muslim is defending the honor of Jesus, that Jesus was a curse? If you go to Galatians, it is mentioned that Christ purchased us by the curse of the law by becoming a curse. For cursed is every man hang upon the cross. These words, these statements, which is also echoed in Deuteronomy, it is very, very difficult for a Muslim to swallow. And think about it. Why would I, as a Muslim scholar, defend the honor of Jesus as to mention he is not a curse? Well, that's the Islamic theory that Jesus was blessed wherever he was, and he was not a curse on a cross. Well, this subject would filter to uh, why Jesus took on the curse of the law and why, he, why a, 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 a ram was needed to be used as for salvation, why Jesus was unique for salvation. But for me as a Muslim, as, from, as I speak from the Quran, it is very simple. Jesus is not a curse, and Muhammad is not a curse, and Moses and Abraham and the prophets of old are not a curse. curse. <clears throat> as far as Jesus in the Quran, his name is mentioned 25 times, and it goes on with his attributes and, and uh, is mentioned a few times without, without uh, going through his name. What I'm going to do, I'm going to briefly uh, go through some of the verses of the Quran mentioning, about mentioning Jesus, and later, towards the end of my 25 minutes, I would try to uh, break the theory where Jesus is divine. Because as a Muslim, Jesus is not divine. Muhammad is not divine. Abraham is no, not divine. And no human being, no matter what miracle he came with, could ever be, be divine. Because God himself is not divine and does not become a human being. The Quran mentions about Jesus, about his, about his mother, with quality in Mala Ikatu Yamar Yamu, in Allah has Tafaki, what a Haraki was Tafaki Allah and Isa Ilalamin. O Mary, behold, that God has chosen for your beautiful son. God is sorry, God has chosen, God has purified thee in Allah's Tafaki, God has chosen thee. What a Haraki and made you pure and wholesome. Was Tafaki Allah and Isa Ilalamin, and you, O Mary, are the highest from all of. Females and for all, from all of womanhood. In another verse, it says, Ya Maryamu, that O Mary, we have called it, O Mary, we have given you glad tides, glad tidings of a child whose name will be Isa ibn Maryam. Wajihan fi dunya, he would be uh, beautiful, he would be honorable in the world. In his daily life, he would be honorable. When in the hereafter, in the next world, he would be among those who enjoy special connection to God. So this is a brief of Jesus. His mother was blessed. And Jesus himself was blessed. And when Jesus was born, according to the Quran, do you know where he was born? He was not born in a stable. Jesus was born under a tree, under a palm tree. And God, as a miracle for Miriam, for Mary, produced in front of her a stream so she could eat from the dates and drink from the stream. And her pregnancy was a very easy pregnancy. As the angel Gabriel came to her and told her and gave her glad tidings of a child, she said, how can I get a child? No man has touched me. So Allah, or God, in, or God has told Jibreel or the angel that, kun fayakun, be in it shall become. And behold, Mary was pregnant. Then she went to her people in the state of pregnancy. And the people mocked her and said, oh Mary, what have you brought? You are a virgin. How can you have a baby? So for Asharat Ilay, she pointed to the baby. And the baby, in defense of his mother, the words uttered by him is, Qala inni Abdullah. I am the slave of Allah. I am the slave of God. Atani al kitab. I, Jesus, have been blessed with a book. Waja'alani nabiya. And I have been made a prophet. Waja'alani mubarak and aina ma kunt. And I am blessed wherever I, am, so I, I will be. And for as long as I live, I have been enjoined to establish the prayer and establish the charity. This is the reality of Jesus, the son of Mary. It is not befitting the honor and the dignity and the might of God Almighty that he should bear a son or a daughter or a brother or a sister. Keep in mind, I, we will have time to go to 
pastor's arguments uh, in the rebuttal system. This is just my uh, speech on Jesus in the Quran. Another beautiful miracle of Jesus in the Quran is that he had the ability and the special gift of healing. He could heal the leper, he could heal the blind, and he could raise the dead by the command of God. How many of you know the words thabitakum? Come on, Bible students, let's see how good Rema Bible School is. Thabitakum, any hands up? What is thabitakum? Al yadin kum. One. Jesus, by the power of God and by the permission of God, instructed the young child, stand by the permission of God. The child was the daughter of Jairus. I will go to that story very, very soon. All these miracles of healing the leper, the blind, and waking, wakening the dead was done via Jesus, by the permission of God. As Jesus himself acclaimed and said, I of myself do nothing. I of myself do nothing. As I hear, I do. And I of myself cannot do nothing. Father is greater than I. And as it's mentioned, concerning Jesus, that he was a man, Jesus, a man, a human being from Nazareth, accredited by God to do wonderful miracles and wonderful things. The Quran speaks of another miracle of Jesus. It's a whole chapter of the Quran is, it's, uh, the chapter's name is Al-Ma'idah. The meaning of Al-Ma'idah is a tablecloth, a tablecloth, somewhere you, something which you eat on. This whole chapter in the Quran speaks about the miracle of Jesus where he produced this beautiful tablecloth. What happened, the disciples of Jesus asked Jesus, oh Jesus, can your God be able and capable of sending down food to us to eat. Now remember from this Quranic verse, the, Quranic, the Quran mentions that the disciples of Jesus did not worship Jesus. They asked Jesus, does your Lord have the ability and capability to send down a tablecloth for us? And this tablecloth would be a sign for us and it will be a celebration for us. So, Jesus warns them that do not ask for a miracle, and if you, the miracle comes, you would, uh, you would not uh, take heed. So nevertheless, Jesus prays, and, it's, and he prays to Allah, he prays to God. And remember, what we're saying, Jesus is praying. As the Bible mentions, Jesus prostrated. Jesus asked for, he asked for many things, he prayed. And as a Muslim view, God himself does not pray. And the difference between the Muslim faith and the Christian faith is that we believe that God does not pray, God does not prostrate, God does not fast, God does not give charity. God is God. He's not in need of worship. But yet Jesus prays. He prays for miracles. He prays for this. He prays for that. And that is a big separation that Jesus is not God himself because God Almighty does not pray. So nevertheless, he says, he prays for this tablecloth. And in this tablecloth, all types of food is given and everybody's happy and they've eaten a good meal. Now the Quran is silent to mention where exactly this goes. The Bible explains it could have been the Last Supper, it could have been the, the, the fish, it could have been the low, the 500, the 500 loaves and thousands of fish, etc. The Quran is silent on the exact miracle. And the Quran is silent about the name Lazarus, it's silent about Jairus, it's silent about many names, as well as the disciples of Jesus. But it does mention the miracles of Jesus. And further on, if we go to see, to, if you study further, the Quran mentions that Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, he is a sign for the coming of the last hour. That Muslims believe that the last hour would not be happening, nor would the last hour ever take place until the Son of Mary returns into the world. As far as the divinity of Jesus, a Muslim does not accept it, and a Muslim is not obliged to accept it, and a Muslim, in all, fa in all fairness, does not want to believe it. Because a Muslim has his own certain beliefs and his own criteria of God, and if those criteria is not matched, that other, the other thing cannot be God. I will go to that. Those five important things 
which are criterion for God. I will go to it later on in my conclusion. James 1.13 mentions that God cannot be tempted. God cannot be tempted. And most of us are familiar with the story where Jesus was tempted. So if God cannot be tempted and Jesus was tempted, how can he be God? Matthew 24.36. No one knoweth the hour. Only God knoweth the hour. Neither the Son nor the Spirit. So if you're going to accept that Jesus is God himself and God man on earth, and Jesus is Father incarnate as a human being on earth, when Jesus was asked regarding the, uh, the last hour, he replied, clear cut, clearly, no ambiguity, no unclear words. He said, no one knoweth the Father. No, sorry, no one, no, no one knoweth the hour except Father, neither the Son, neither the Spirit. There's a clear distinction that Jesus does not have the knowledge of Father because he does not know the last hour. As Allah says in the Quran, It is only God, it is only Allah, it is only the great Elohim that knoweth the last hour. When Muhammad was asked concerning the last hour, he replied, I do not know when it is. And Jesus himself does say he does not know when it is. So this is one of the most important or crucial evidences for a Muslim to negate the divinity of Jesus Christ. This one, a few biblical uh, apologists might have heard a few times, but as a Muslim, we have to say it because this is our defense. Jesus was not aware of fruit on a tree. One day he went to Bethany, or on the route to Bethany, he saw a fig tree with his companions and he decided to partake of the, of the tree. When he reached the tree, what happened? It was bare, there was no figs. So if Jesus was God Almighty, why did he not know if there was figs on the tree or not? I know the argument will come that he withered the tree that was withering away of the Old Testament and this, but I'm looking at it from a, a Muslim apologist critical view. You want me to accept Jesus as being divine? Okay, if he's man and God at the same time, he would have known if there was figs on the tree or not. In Numbers, 23.19, it is mentioned clearly, God is not a man that he should lie, nor son of a man that he should repent. Exodus 33.20, you can't see my face, for anybody who shall see me shall perish. And Paul also writes something about Jesus in Timothy, Timothy 6.15. Before he speaks about Jesus, then he comes to, to speaking about God himself. It says, God the blessed and the only, the only ruler, the king of kings, lord of lords, alone is immortal. He lives in unapproachable light. No one has seen him or nobody can see him. This is the Muslim view that God is light. God is not a man. Nobody can see him. So these few biblical verses echoes what the Muslim says or what the Quranic view on Jesus is, that he's a man and God himself has not entered the world as a human being that we should see him. Yes, Jesus is the Messiah. He's a mighty messenger of God. He's a great prophet of God, a man of miracles and wonders and signs, but not divine, not God. You see, the Jews have relegated Jesus. They have relegated the Messiah to a fake prophet, while the house of Paul and the Christian of, the Christian of today have elevated Jesus into divinity. And one step further, the Roman Catholics have started making idols of Jesus and Mary and putting that in their churches, going one step and making an idol which is against the biblical teachings in totality, as all Protestants and evangelists would know. And the Muslims have not elevated Jesus, nor have we relegated Jesus, but we have left him as he is, a mighty messenger of God. And that's it, nothing else. In huwa illa abdun an'amna alayhi wa ja'alnahu mathalan li bani Israel. That Messiah, Jesus, is nothing except a servant that we have honored and we have made him as a sign for the house of Israel. And Jesus himself says that I have been sent only to the house of Israel. So in Islam, we have no hatred for Jesus. We have only love for him. But we have not dared elevate him or anybody else to the state, to the status of divinity. And the Quran says it beautifully. 
لن يستنكف المسيح أن يكون عبدا لله ولا الملائكة المقربون Neither the angels in heaven nor the Christ himself feel it difficult or a burden to come to God as a servant and to come to God as a, as a, as a subdued being. And tell me, does a servant pray? Yes. Did Jesus pray? Yes. But now as a Christian, you have to believe that God, Jesus is God in order to be saved, etc. And my job is to inform you that honor Jesus, love Jesus, but do not make Jesus into father. I would like to, how many minutes do I have? Ten minutes, okay. I'm going to go to the story very, very slowly. And I'm going to use this story or this incident to prove that Jesus is not divine. Remember, we are not the Antichrist. We love Jesus. Remember, I am defending the honor of Jesus where you Christians are saying that Jesus is cursed on the tree and Jesus is cursed on the cross. And that's not the subject of discussion. But remember how much it... I'm not lying. I'm a, as a Muslim, I have to honor Jesus and say, hold on, hold on. My Jesus is not accursed. If you as a Christian want to say Jesus is cursed, fine, say it. And I'm not going to push you and be derogatory to you. I know you've got your reasons, and I, I also know your reasons or your, your, your rebuttal or why you're going to say Jesus wasn't accursed. But look at the love I have for Jesus. I'm going to say he's not accursed. And that's the Quranic view. And some of you might be stunned. Do the Muslims would love Jesus to such an extent that they would keep their necks out or be on a hit list to say, Jesus is not a curse. Yes, because he is not a curse. Okay, let me go to the story. <clears throat> We're going to have to open up to Mark 5, 25, 30. If you have your Bibles here, fine. If not, not a problem. What happens here, this is a story. This is a story where if a biblical scholar has to put it, you're going to get a good hallelujah. And you're going to get a Muslim scholar who puts it in a different way. You're going to get a good takbir. But my point is not that. My point, I don't want a hallelujah. I don't want a takbir. I want you to analyze what I'm going to tell you. Think about it. Digest it. And pastor, this one rebuttal, you need to really tackle it. <clears throat> okay. Basically what happens, Jesus, we all know he was carrying on miracles. He went to, uh, he, he was gone to a certain place. Uh, the, uh, the synagogue had called him to heal the daughter of Jairus. And he healed the, the daughter of Jairus and carried on. He went from the ship, he went to another place. And as he went to another place, the crowds followed him. Because that's the holy man, that's the great man, that's the great rabbi. Jesus of Nazareth is here, the healer. So the crowds thronged upon him. And they hugged, or they, while he was walking, they enshrouded him and he started walking. And there was a young girl who had a sickness for 12 years. Her bleeding could not stop. She had menstruation bleeding for 12 years. She spent all her money in order to get healed, but she could not get healed. And she gave up hope. And she realized that, hold on, years, Jesus, let me just go behind him, touch him, get some blessings, and hopefully I'll get healed. Do you familiar with the story? Muslims, are you familiar with the story? Familiar? Right. Alhamdulillah. So we got a story. Now what happens in this biblical verses? The woman goes from behind. He goes up to the great rabbi and somehow sneaks her hand in and touches the thobe, the cloth of Jesus, from behind. And what happens to Jesus? He says, my I can feel my power is gone. I'm losing some power. Something has, you know, like you have an electrical short uh, circuit, you know, something went out. Or in our context for the young guys, you know, you have mortal combat. When you give one guy a punch there, you see his power being zapped. So that's what happened. Some of Jesus' power got zapped, and Jesus sensed it. And what happened to the sick lady? Immediately she got healed. Her blood came right. She got healed. Now the great Messiah. He's not a, he's not a, he's a great, he's an honorable sight, you know. He's not, he's a Messiah. He asked, who touched me? He asked, who touched me? So the disciples say, there's a crowd you go, there's a crowd of Jesus. You know, there's a crowd. People are thonging up. Uh, people are uh, crowded with you. People are with you. So he asked again, like, who touched me? Then what happens? Jesus looks around. Like, he's looking around. Where's Muhammad? Okay, there's he there. I know him. Right. Now Jesus doesn't know this girl. He doesn't know her. 
And she was at the back. Now he's looking around. Now Jesus doesn't. Nobody's owning up. And out of shyness and bashfulness, or on that occasion, or out of a happiness, or whatever reason, the young girl that was here came to Jesus and explained the story. It is I that touched you, and this happened, this happened, etc. And what does Jesus tell her? She tells her, daughter, salamun alaik, peace be with you. Daughter, what was Jesus says? Daughter. I will come back to daughter just now. And carry on on your way. Okay. My points. If Jesus is God, how can power be zapped away from him? How can energy be taken out from him without his permission? Remember, Jesus did not go to heal this girl. This girl came behind. And she zapped power away from him. And if Jesus is divine, and if Jesus is divine power, that divine power would have entered that young girl. But it was not divine power that entered that young girl. It was merely blessings of healing. Baraka. It was blessings that went. But Jesus knew that something snapped him because he knew a miracle had happened. A miracle happened because when a miracle happens to a prophet, he would know something happens. Even when Prophet Muhammad, he had to do something, he would sweat. Things would, it was a, a difficult thing. You know, when, you, when he got inspiration or wahi, it was a difficult upon him. So he perceived that his power, power was zapped. So God, right, here's the question. Can God's power be zapped? Yes or no? Okay, if Jesus was God himself and man, God, divine, why did he have to find who the girl was? He would have knew exactly this was Walwama Ramadan. This is Sheikh from Kenya. This is the person. If he knows everybody, he would have known who it was. But Jesus was a man, he was a Messiah. He was not aware who the girl was. So how can you worship a God who does not know who the girl was? Then Jesus tells her, daughter, go in peace. Now hold on. I'm going to analyze this in a very apologetical way. I'm a Muslim apologist. That means we don't, it's not that we're asking sorry, sorry, no. It means we are making situations and reading from your books and giving you questions so you can reply to us back and forth. Okay. If Jesus is God, man. Divine power left him into a young girl without his permission. And Jesus, the son of God, is calling a girl who's got some of his power, healing power, whatever power you want to call it, calls her daughter. Is this girl divine? Is this girl divine? As a Christian, you cannot say she's divine. As a Muslim, you know she's not divine. She has only got Blessings from Jesus. But my argument is that, okay, Jesus used the exact word, not ambiguous I am or I whatever. He calls the young girl daughter. So can she be part of the Trinity? If yes, why? If not, why? Thus you could go back home it's time. and think about. 